Hi, this is Lady C, and welcome to another episode of The Critical Thought. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Spike Robinson, the assistant editor at the Open Minds Foundation, and she'll be talking about Robert J. Lifton's Eight Criteria of Thought Control. You're listening to The Critical Thought, where we challenge our listeners to use critical thinking when examining the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Spike, welcome to the program. Thanks, Lady C. It's a pleasure to be here again. And JT, I want to thank you for being on the program as well. Well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Well, Spike, you want to tell us a little bit about Robert J. Lifton? Yes, this is an interesting story, is that Robert J. Lifton was acting as a psychiatrist in 1953. Who He was interviewing American servicemen who had been prisoners of war held in China, and then they had been kept in these thought reform camps, and he was one of these psychiatrists who was on the site to help these people recover from this extremely heavy thought reform where they were signing confessions. Uh, there was one priest who said, I was in control of this horrible thing that the Vatican was doing to bring down the Chinese people. And it wasn't even true, but he signed it and he had a detailed confession. And once he got out, it was like, but I never did that. Why did I sign the confession? So Lifton was the one who unwove these people's minds from where they had come to believe that they were horrible people and he helped them recover and find themselves after some of the most severe thought control there was. And he wrote his 1961 book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, a study of brainwashing in China. And it's in his chapter 22, which he now calls the infamous chapter 22, that he brought up the eight criteria that are needed for thought control. Now, not all of them are going to show up in the same balances, but this is in an abusive family, in an abusive cult, in any high control group, you're going to find these criteria. So, Spike, can you go ahead on and tell us what these eight criteria of thought control are? Certainly. The eight criteria for thought control are milieu control, loading the language, mystical manipulation, sacred science, demand for purity, confession, doctrine over person, and dispensing of existence. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss those then. We'll start with milieu control. Milieu control, it's we control what you experience and how you experience it. Now, you're not going to just find this in a cult. You're going to find milieu control anywhere. When you step into a department store, they've got the light set. They've got the music set. They are setting the stage for the experience. So when you go into a group that wants to get a certain effect from you, they're going to set the lighting a certain way. There might You might be asked to take off your shoes, but you are stepping into their party, their control, their area, so that everything is set. You go into a Catholic church, you've got incense and the lights. Remember that this all exists on a continuum as well, so that, yes, milieu control happens when you go into a friend's house and she asks you to take off your shoes and puts on some music, all the way to when you get into the Moonies, you've got to put on these robes and you've got to chant here and you've got to be in this room for this time and you can't go somewhere else. So, in short, we control what you experience and how you experience it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And now the next one, loading the language. This is the one that I've re I really think XJWs can relate to. Because what do you call your organization? What do you call the watchtower? It's the... We call it the truth. Exactly. Now that, to my mind, is the most virulent and horrible example of loaded language that you're going to find. It's a lie. And yet, even people who have been out for decades, I was just listening to John Cedars, and he slips and calls it the truth. It is deep into you that this is the truth, even if you know it's not the truth so that it makes it that much harder to question 
the organization because it's the truth. You know, Spike, you made an excellent point about loaded language. Uh, one of the things that's often used along with the phrase the truth is how they view former teachings or past teachings that were taught as the truth. They refer to them as past truth, which is interesting because how can something be a past truth if it was never the truth? But they use this type of loaded language so they can avoid actually using the word false teaching. Right. And also, we, we often say the friends. Yeah, I, I still say that. Or the faithful and discreet slave. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, slaves don't wear a couple thousand dollar Rolexes and tell people what to do with their lives in life or death cons- situations. Mm-hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses really have a, an extensive language that we used. The only people that beat them, ladies, see, are the Scientologists. And if you've ever talked to an ex-Scientologist, I do all the time, you've got all these letters, acronyms, everything's, I went to the ARC and had to speak to the CID and the AFQ, and, and after a while, your brain just shuts down. So loaded language has two functions. One is it separates people from the outside world. So you're your own little crew here. And nobody else knows what you're saying. It's like speaking your own little code. Mm -hmm. And you no longer understand what other people are saying. So it creates this wall of language. That's exactly right. So mystical manipulation. This is a good one. This is one. There was a guru called Sai Baba. And he actually still has followers, even though he's dead. And what he used to do was he'd electrify the kneeler in front of him. So that when you kneeled on the little kneeler in his little personal interview with him, you get this little tingle. Ooh, I'm in the presence of holiness. It took a Japanese news crew to discover it. And even then, people were like, oh, no, it's his holiness. And that's the thing is like a lot of New Age groups will tell you to rub your eyes. And all of a sudden, you're seeing these holy sparks. And you're seeing the holy sparks because you're doing our system. Well, no, you're rubbing your eyes. That's your optic nerve saying, ouch, don't do that. Um, So mystical manipulation is basically creating this mystical experience and then making damn sure that the person attributes it to whatever belief is being professed. So in the JWs, you got the great parking space. That's because Jehovah's on your side. Or you get no car accident after leaving, quote unquote, the truth. Oh, well, that's because you were moving away from Jehovah. Works both ways. Oh, yeah, they scare people. Because when I left the organization, one of my best friends, when she found out that JT and I stopped going to the Kingdom Hall, she said, you got to get back to the Kingdom Hall, Kathy. She said, because if you don't, something bad is going to happen to you. Now, that's another thing that's a little that we should bookmark for a later talk, because that's called phobia. In induction and that's a way of controlling people to keep them in actually abusive abusive husbands or even abusive wives will do it to their spouse if you leave me nobody else will ever love you mm-hmm. I've heard it's that the before. same thing or um, an abusive parent saying to a saying to an adult child if you don't do this you're going to end up starving in a gutter mm-hmm so, yeah, but uh, mystical manipulation. So phobia in, induction can be a little bit of mani- a, another flavor of the mystical manipulation because it is definitely the manipulation of we've got this special truth and we're going to make it work for you even if we have to fake it. And that leads into sacred science where this is a lot of the people who are doing a lot of the um, fad diets and also a lot of the conspiracy theories is it's true because we say it's the truth and any contrasting evidence will immediately be dismissed because oh they just like um i've heard a lot that dinosaur bones were actually planted by satan to fool all of us worldly folks into believing in evolution i've heard it from a maybe it's something that's british because i've heard it from a couple of british xjw's that the dinosaur bones were put there by satan to convince us worldly folks about evolution so that's like an urban legend yeah so sacred science is basically a way of making their truth 
the truth and you can't question it because it's the truth and you this is where you'll get your circular reasoning where okay maybe evolution exists but Adam and Eve really existed too and we can't question that because here's this book that tells us it's true uh, let's see then there is the demand for purity this is the one you get where you get the little bits of having to give up stuff and any JW will know the demand for purity that's the you have to do this you have to do that by the way you can't drink to excess you can't smoke cigarettes you can't do this you can't do that only those good enough can get it and oh, also absolutely. you have to be good enough and are you ever good enough to them of course not because the bar keeps on being raised and raised and raised so that demand for purity is a never-ending mm -hmm. battle moving on to confession now when you go to like uh, Scientology you go to the one of the first things that you get is a personality test or a stress test where you confess what's stressing you out and they will get as much personal information as possible and in JW's you're in, are, how are you guys encouraged to confess? Jehovah's Witnesses, they practice confession simply by an individual going to one of the elders. This is typically an elder that a person feels comfortable with, and they will tell the elder whatever their quote-unquote perceived sin is. And at that point, the elder typically, uh, depending on the degree or the type of sin, because elders basically have a list of various types of sins and the severity of how those sins are to be viewed. And as a result, it will determine what the person does going forward. The elder can either counsel the person right then and there, or it may be a matter that the elders feel, I have to present this to the rest of the body of elders. So it depends on uh, what quote-unquote sins the person has committed. Would the individual elder say, just don't do it again and, and Jehovah will forgive you? Well, once again, it, it depends on the severity of what is the quote-unquote perceived sin. Uh, generally speaking, the answer is no. But a person could be, depending on what they've done, the elder could just simply just say, don't do it again. But generally speaking, that will not be the case because most of the time for sins, when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they're pretty much either judicial matters or at least a meeting of at least two elders to address whatever the issue is. Usually in the, con the cult of confession, as Robert L J. Lifton put it, the idea was it would make you feel better after unburdening yourself. Catholics know this. Scientologists know this. A whole bunch of people know this. Anybody who's been to therapy knows this. That it feels damn good to say, ah, I did this. And somebody just go, well, did you really mean to hurt? Well, no, but we'll do better next time. That is an empowering and healing experience that can be used, of course, against you in a cult or a high control group. Would you like to speak to how a past sin would be brought up against you in the future in the Watchtower? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, they can be used in many different ways. Uh, if anything comes up on their radar, as it were, in a few years, uh, they will reference back to those things. In fact, that is one of the reasons why a congregation has what is known as a letter of introduction. We did a video on that explaining how when Jehovah's Witnesses move from one congregation to another congregation, there is a letter. It's almost like a biography or almost like a resume of what you have done wrong in the congregation, basically. And those letters will sit in the file. And if something comes up in regards to you, uh, elders will quickly refer back to those things. And they can be years old, but they will refer back to them. That's interesting. Then we move on to doctrine over person, and this is the one where it employs something called gaslighting. It comes from the movie Gaslighting of the same title, which depicted a man trying to make his wife think she was crazy, mostly by moving stuff around on her and telling her that something had happened that hadn't or that something that had happened was all in her imagination. This is... A broader form of gaslighting where basically you're being told that this is reality, but it doesn't match up with what your reality is. I remember a guy in my high school telling me that men had one less rib than women. I said, no, if you feel your ribs, you can feel that we have the same amount of ribs. He said, no, it's wrong. So it's when your facts don't match the truth, your facts are wrong. 
Like, I have a friend who is extremely against using a microwave, and she says, oh, it'll give you horrible things. It's like, I've been using a microwave since 1975, and none of those horrible things will happen. Well, no, no, you've just gotten lucky. And it can happen in a high control group in that, basically, here is our rules, and here is what we know is true about the leader. The leader never loses his temper. Well, if you happen to be the leader's personal servant, and you've seen him slap the dog, but the leader never loses his temper. So, sorry, your facts are wrong. That's doctrine over person. Yeah, this is something that witnesses are pretty good at. Facts don't match the truth. Uh, I'll give you just a perfect example. Uh, the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses that, about the world ending in 1975. Uh, you generally will get Jehovah's Witnesses who will take a number of positions when you ask them about 1975. Some will admit that there were some brothers who mentioned that 1975 the world would end. Of course, you never know who those some brothers are. You just never get no names on who these some brothers are. And then you have others who say, no, we didn't We didn't teach anything about 1975. We, we, we didn't, that, 75, no, that was just a misunderstanding by people who don't like us. Well, the facts don't really support that. In fact, after the Watchtower had so much blowback from 1975 that the Watchtower finally came out in a yearbook and admitted that the Watchtower governing body, the faithful and discreet slave, they were responsible for the ideas and the concepts about the world ending in 1975 in regards to 1975. So when people start talking about, you know, some brothers, I always tell them, hold up, let's, let's stop this right here. Uh, the Watchtower has acknowledged that they are responsible for 1975. The governing body is responsible for it, and that's where it ends. And as you all know, the word responsible means that you are to blame for whatever the cause is. So, uh, but for the average Jehovah's Witness, they will deny it because they'll deny what is actually the truth. That information can be found in the 1980 yearbook. Those are some very interesting points, JT. The final criteria is dispensing of existence. Now, we see this very, very sadly in almost any belief system. That is, the unbeliever is not quite worth the same as a believer. And you can see this in, well... Let's think about it. How many people are going to survive Armageddon? And who are those people? They're all the faithful. For some reason, the rest of us worldly people, it's okay that this loving God comes down and kills some six and a half billion people and leaves the rest alone because they're the believers and we as the unbelievers, our existence is forfeit. We don't matter and our blood is fertilizer for your flowers. So the truth is worth more than life, especially an outsider's life. So it also goes that once you become an outsider, your life's not worth anything. And also, even if you stay in the group, the truth is still worth more than your life. I mean, weigh it against this big, all-powerful God that must be obeyed at all costs. What is one little mortal to deal with that? so that you can get people even killing to protect the church, or even letting people die, or hiding horrible incidences of pedophile, pedophile abuse, because it's much more important to keep the name of Jehovah t intact than it is to protect this one child or these several thousand children, as it turns out. Well, yeah, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, they always look at it from an angle of casting a bad light on the organization. And so um, they would rather for them not to take things to the police. And they will tell you that you have a choice to go. But you going to the police, you know, is going to make it hard for you at the Kingdom Hall because, yeah. you know, that's not what they really want you to do. So they kind of like hold you hostage over over that. Because oh, yeah. Anybody had, who's listened to the Australian Royal Commission, yeah, I yeah. was shouting at the TV. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But also, if, you've, if I can also put out a shout out to a great film, Spotlight. It's about the news crew that first broke the story of the Vatican child abuse scandal. And they were in Boston, which 
I'm sure you know, we're both within reasonable driving distance of Boston. It is a very Catholic city, and they got so much guff at first. Why are you doing this? Why are you harming the church? Why are you speaking out against the mother church, even from non-Catholics? And, and they had an agenda. The sadder thing is that, yeah, your life's not worth it. So, yes, if you get a hemorrhage during during childbirth, well, your life is less important than than the truth of your resurrection, which is really doctrine over person. But then the dispensing of existence, say, in some of the some of the. Uh, some of the militant groups, whether they be the militant uh, Christians in Montana or the militant uh, folks in Daesh over in Sudan and those areas, is that to the guys in like Boko Haram, the ultra-Islamist group, somebody who isn't their brand of Islam, they're getting slaughtered by the thousands. And actually, it's in the Quran, it's... Uh, it's actually a, more of a sin to kill an outsider than it is an insider in uh, one of the verses of the Quran because you haven't given them a chance to to uh, see the truth. So you really should be nice to those outsiders. But of course, if you're in a high control group, that gets twisted on its ear and all of a sudden the insiders are much more important than the outsiders. I don't know about that for the Jehovah's Witnesses because even though they have a measure of um, the way they feel each feel about each other, they uh, will go to great lengths to impress outsiders because they want to um, c convert them. So they will um, be nicer to people who are not Jehovah's Witnesses than they will be to individuals that are already baptized because that's where the shunning comes from. So the shunning part is like, that, that's what happened to my sister. She never got baptized as a witness, so uh, both of my aunts talked to her where they won't speak to me. And you know, the thing is though, is that it's interesting because I as an outsider, yeah, they'd probably be very polite to me, but at the same time, I'm still toast when the tribulation comes. Absolutely. And I was like, what? That just is totally on its ear. One of the sadder stories that I heard was someone who took blood and was laying in his hospital bed and his mom told him that had he been baptized, she would be shunning him now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So these are Lifton's eight criteria of thought control. And I appreciate Spike coming on to our program to discuss them. And Spike will let us know how you can learn more about Lifton's eight criteria of thought control. If you want to learn more about Robert J. Lifton and his eight criteria of thought control, I cannot recommend any more than looking up his book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. It's a great read and also a very, very instructive manual on how control can be maintained and also broken. So Spike, we mm -hmm. want to thank you for being on the program, and JT, I want to thank you for being a guest on our show as well. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Well, thanks. I'm glad to have been here.